we'll jump in and we'll continue where we are last time. And weirdly, uh, this picture tells you kind of everything. This gives you all the insight you need to know. It's just like weird and hilarious. Whoops. Um, let me fix this. Um, yeah, so, you know, here we're just minimizing a quadratic. We know exactly what the minimum is. It's just x equals zero, right? So we just try something like, you know, this steepest, uh, here we're using uh, gradient descent, right? And you can actually work, it's just simple enough, you can actually work out what the iterations are. And what you'll find, I mean, you have a formula for it, but the picture is basically this. Um, this, this shows you, the, these, uh, these curves show you the level sets. And what you can see pretty clear, and you're beginning to see it already here, is if the level sets are poorly conditioned, meaning they're, they're and isotropic. Isotropic means you're kind of the same in all directions. And isotropic means you're not the same. You're different in different directions. So if your curvature is different in different directions, right? Or another way to say it, if your sublevel sets are not nearly spherical, then gradient descent works quite poorly. And you can see why it does this kind of weird zig zigzagging. Okay, so that, that's the, and then, you know, the flip side of this is, you know, how well does gradient descent do when the sublevel sets are like actually literally spherical or, or balls, Euclidean balls. And in this, here the answer is it just, it's one step. Okay? So takeaway message is that the efficiency or speed of, the efficiency or speed uh, of uh, gradient descent is going to depend on how aspherical or anisotropic the uh, sublevel sets are. And here was just an example to show, you know, it, it works. I mean, it's an example in two dimensions. It's kind of uh, uh, silly, um, you know, just, just to show that you are getting zigzagging or something like that. Um, and I think we looked at this last time. Um, and now it, now it comes to, you know, what, so the conclusion is, you, depending on the problem, if, you're, if your sublevel sets are very well conditioned or spherical or symmetric or however you want to say it, uh, they're, or isotropic or something like that, then, uh, you know, gradient descent is fine. Uh, so what this hints, though, is that there's something strange about it. It's, it's actually a bit weird, right? Because when you think about, when you think about it, why, why, why would you not use the, uh, gradient, the negative gradient as your descent direction, right? It just, something seems very weird about it because you, you arrive at a point and then you'd say, hey, if I was to move a small amount in any direction, which would be the direction where my objective would go down the fastest, right? And it seems like you'd be an idiot to take anything other than that direction. And so we had said, well, it's the negative gradient. When you analyze that statement further, it turns out that depends on the metric you're using, right? So that's actually the, so it actually depends on the norm you use. And so the way you think of that, one way to do this in a kind of a principled way is to say, well, you know, the amount if you go in a small direction v, then the amount f is going to decrease is about equal to the gradient of f transpose v. And you want that negative, right? So then you'd think, well, okay, take v equals minus the gradient. That's an obvious, that's an obvious choice. Um, you can't just say choose v to minimize grad f of x transpose v. You can't do that because it's unbounded below. It's silly, right? So, and here's where the metric comes in. You have to give a norm to limit that. You have to say, no, I, I, you know, I want the norm of V to be, let's say, equal to one or less than or equal to one. It would be the same thing, right? So you do that. Um, and here, now the, notice that this norm up here on V is a general norm. It is not the two norm, necessarily. It's a, just a general norm. Um, so this is referred to as the steepest descent direction, right? So, and it, it's gonna depend on the norm. Right, and then you can unnormalize it. It's actually convenient to normalize it by the um, by the the dual norm of the gradient, um, and then you get you, you get something that looks like that. Right, um, so the steepest descent method is basically it's and it's specified by a norm. You give a norm. So once you you give a norm, then the steepest descent method is is uh, completely specified because that's that's the direction you're going to use right and you get it the convergence is similar uh, to the to this descent but we'll look at some examples to kind of understand this um, so the first one is uh, if you just what is steepest descent in the Euclidean norm it's it's precisely gradient descent right yeah uh, why do you 
normalize it by the uh, dual norm of the gradient? You actually don't have to. There's no reason to normalize it. It's just it's just so that a lot of the equations get simpler if you do the convergence analysis. Yeah, so that, that's the only reason. Also, that way, like for example, the steepest descent direction with the L2 norm is literally the negative gradient. Otherwise, it'd be the negative gradient scaled. You know, it'd be a unit vector. It's, it's actually, the, it'd be the negative gradient divided by the norm of the, neg uh, norm of the gradient. Right, so unit vector. Um, so if you use a quadratic norm, so quadratic norm is you take a quadratic form with a positive definite uh, matrix, take the square root, that's a quadratic norm. Um, and you know, here's an example of a, uh, I guess this is a unit ball in a quadratic norm, which is an ellipsoid. And then it says, here's the negative gradient. And it says you should minimize the inner product of, or sorry, you should, yeah, you should minimize the inner product of a point in this set with the negative, or I guess minimize it with the gradient, which means maximize the inner product with the negative gradient. So basically it says, these are the, these are the sub -lub, this the hyperplanes that are, uh, that are going to be, uh, this is, this is the, the outward normal. They look like these are the, these, these are the level curves. And it says you want to go as far as you can this way. And you end up here, right? And so this is in fact the, uh, the, 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 the this is going to be the steepest descent direction in the norm, in the norm where this is the unit ball we're showing you. Okay. Um, now you can work things out like you're never going to, so it actually, it does change the direction. It's very weird. It changes the direction. Never, never rotates it more than 90 degrees. It cannot, obviously, because then you, then you wouldn't have a, you'd have a positive inner product with the, uh, with the gradient, right? So this is it. So, so weirdly, so, so it, what it really, the real answer is it says that when you stop and you ask for directions and you'd say, what, what direction would be the direction where the function, where you go downhill the fastest, the person should ask you, yeah, in what norm? Because what you select as a norm is going to change the directions they give you, right? So, and you can see that it, you know, it, it kind of, you know, it, it distorts the, the, the directions. Okay. Um, it's actually super interesting. Like if you do the L1 norm, um, what you'll work out is actually also a very um, kind of simple thing. If you take the inner product of a gradient with a vector whose L1 norm is less than one, you want to minimize that, what you will do is you will find the entry, the axis along with where the partial derivative or entry of the gradient is most negative, right? And then you'll go, sorry, yeah, you'd find the largest one and then go in obviously the direction, the decreasing direction, right? And, and so that's actually got a, that's a named method from the like 40s and 50s. And it basically, I mean, that, that one has got a very simple story to it. You stop where you are and you say, uh, then you, then you ask, uh, not which direction is the steepest direction to go down. I mean, you, you can, it's in the L1, but you, what you really ask is you ask, if I go along axis one, how much is it, how much am I going to go down? If I go along axis two, how much is it going to go down? And you find the one where you're going to go down the most, and then you simply go along the axis. So that's an, that's a so-called axis aligned step. People would call it. Okay. Um, and again, you know, the picture shows how you actually get a different direction. Okay. Um, now the the choice of the metric or the norm for steepest descent is going to make a big difference, right? And um, here's just this baby example again, where this is the first one shows you steepest descent with a norm whose unit ball looks like this. And I yeah, I don't know, you just eyeball it. You can see this, you know, some number of iterations. And here we take steepest descent in using a norm where the unit ball is like skewed this way. And what you see is that has exacerbated the convergence horribly, right? And so what this tells us is kind of the, it tells you kind of the obvious thing. It, it says that if you, what you really want is you want a norm or a, or a metric or something like that, that's kind of aligned with the sublevel sets of your, of, of your function, right? That, in other words, it's one which kind of has a roughly the same shape. I mean, so this is just a very simple example to show this. I'm just pretending that this, that this function, you know, looks kind of fatter than it does look tall, right? And so over here, this use of norm, this, this selection of norm actually improves the convergence. This one exacerbated. 
exacerbates it. Okay, just make 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 sense, right? So I mean, these are just sort of ideas, just to I mean, but it, it's kind of it's the essence of, of where we're going, um, because now we go to the the the, uh, the if you keep going with this logic, you end up at something called the Newton step. So the Newton step, um, you know, you you actually will use what you'll do is you take the Hessian of the second derivative of the function at the current point. And you then use that as your metric, right? And so the argument now makes perfect sense, right? Because if I said, if you say, okay, I accept the idea that I should choose, let's say, a, a metric that captures the shape of my function, right? That, that's what I should do, right? Well, actually, let's have a discussion about smooth functions near their minimum. Let, let's have that discussion just for fun. What do smooth functions look like, smooth convex functions look like near their minimum? What do they look like? <coughs> they're just quadratic, right? And they're quadratic with what, what, what is, what's the Hessian there of, of the, I mean, well, look at that, <laughs> gives it away. It's, that's the Hessian, it's the Hessian. The sublevel sets, right? If this is a smooth convex function, that's the minimizer. And then I say, what do the level sets look like? Sub, the, they look like this. Now, these are not exactly ellipsoids. I mean, unless the function is exactly quadratic. But this is what they look like, right? And I mean, eventually they start looking not like ellipsoids. They start looking like that, right? Because um, who knows, right? But down near the minimum, they look really very much like ellipsoids, right? Um, and the shape of the ellipsoid is determined by the Hessian of the function at this point. Okay, so this is, yeah, by the way, if you're, in, if you're in statistics or if you're not in statistics but know some statistics, you'd recognize this immediately. This, if you look at the negative log likelihood, that's going to be, this is going to be, for the, in, in, this is in your parameter space, this point is going to be your maximum likelihood or minimum negative log likelihood point. And then, then if I ask you, well, tell me about models that have a likelihood almost as high as my maximum likelihood. Everybody following this? Yeah, then basically I'm looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm looking exactly at level curves that are very close to the maximum likelihood. I pull down from the maximum likelihood and I get sets. I, now these are sets in, these are parameters and models that fit the data you've seen, right? Um, what do they look like? Well, if, if the loss, if the negative log likelihood is convex and smooth, right? Then they look, they're, ellip, they're approximately ellipsoidal. Um, and so actually, the, and the ellipsoid is determined by the Hessian of the log likelihood at the maximum likelihood point which is, of course, the Fisher information. Everybody got that? And so this tells you very good ways to, give you, to, to get sets of model parameters which give you almost the maximum likelihood on the data you've seen. So, okay. This, this again, if you know about this, fine. And if you don't, that's okay too, right? So I'm just saying that the, this idea is kind of like everywhere. Okay. So now we, we connect it back to this conversation and said, here's what you should do. You should use steepest descent but you should, what you should do is you need to get a, a metric that kind of looks like the curvature of your, of, of your function, right? So this would be a stunningly good method. Ready for my method? It says, do steepest descent. And someone says, yeah, which, what, 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 you know, which quadratic norm are you going to use? Which P? And I would say, oh, the Hessian of your function at the optimum. Everybody follow this? Boy, would that work well. Everybody... Got, got that, right? That would work unbelievably well. Only, only minor problem is, someone says, okay, well, what is the Hessian at the optimum? And then the answer would be something like, well, first, you know, minimize it, and then I'll tell you the Hessian. Or which is kind of like, this is stupid, right? Because that's, that's what I want to do in the first place. Everybody follow this? Okay, so instead, we're going to use, we're simply going to use the Hessian at the current point as the best approximation we can make of the Hessian at the optimal point. Everybody following this? Okay, so that's one way to explain what Newton method is, right? So, um, ah, and if we, if we take the Newton step and, and each, each time we redo it, we're actually changing the metric. And so sometimes people refer to this, this is a variable metric method, right? Because you're actually, you're changing the metric when you stop and ask for directions and say, hey, what's the fastest way to go down from here? And then, then someone on their toes says, yeah, in what metric? You actually, every time, every step you take, you change it. Okay? 
So that's the, uh, everybody, these, I mean, these are just ideas, of ways you can think about what the Newton step is. Okay. There are lots of other ways to think of it too. Um, so um, here's another completely beautiful method. It says, um, it says let's, let's expand, let's have a second order approximation of our function. And that's of course just that, nothing but that. And you'd say, all right, let's minimize that. If you minimize the second, if you form a second order approximation of a function at a point, minimize it, you get the Newton step. Everybody got that? So that, that's also like just makes perfect sense, right? So you, uh, yeah. So um, another way is you could think about it, about the optimality conditions and that looks like this. So this would be here, here's a picture of the first one. So here's the function f, right? Um, we're at x here. Then that, what I do is I get the second order approximation here. This is f hat of f, right? By the way, the first order approximation has to be an underestimator of f. The second order, we don't know. Could be above or below. You don't know, right? So, okay, so here, here you are here. Um, here you are uh, here. Uh, we get a second order. And what, what it means to be a second order approximation is that f and f hat right near here are extremely close, which is my way of saying close cubed. It's small cubed, right? The, the, yeah, something like that. It's, it's really like they agree to second order here. Right? So it's a super good approximation right here. Okay, so we form that, that's this dash thing. And you can see over here, it's on the wrong side. It's on, you know, it's, it's a lower bound up here. It's an upper bound. And the minimizer of this is this. And so this is the Newton step, the difference between here and here, okay? Um, another one is you linearize the optimality condition. And you'd say, you know, I'm at a point X. I want a point where the gradient of F is zero. And you go, cool, what, then what are you gonna do? And you say, well, I'm gonna perturb X by V. I'm gonna take a step V. But what you'd like is you'd like the gradient of F of X plus V to equal zero. But you don't know how to solve that in general. There's one case where you do, we'll get to that in a minute. So you do this, instead you'd say, well, you know what, I'll approximate this using calculus. So what this gradient is, is, is if this is the first order expansion of the, of the gradient, is the gradient um, here, this is gonna be, the, this is gonna be the, the first order thing, it's actually the following. It's the gradient plus the second derivative times the displacement, right? So this is that. And then what you do is you say, okay, I don't know what's actually gonna happen to the gradient, but this, I, this, this I know, I, this I get, this I can, I can compute these two, and I'll just solve this equation, and that gives us again the Newton step. So that all, all makes sense. This is, I mean, I, I hate to give. There's even there are, are even more explanations, but this is these are just interpretations of what it is. Okay, so that's the Newton step. Um, oh, and here's a picture of the second one um, in one in one D. Uh, so actually, New, Newton would have been quite familiar with this this picture, right? So um, Here's the derivative, right? Uh, it's increasing because the function is con convex, right? So here it is. And what we want to do is we want to find the zero crossing like this. So we want to find that point there. So how do you do that? Well, you're at a point here and you simply here take a, a linear, I guess you would say, or affine approximation of the derivative at that point. That's this dashed line here. And then wherever that is zero, that's our next point, right? Um, by the way, if I were to do it again, what would happen? So if I went to this point, calculated the, the, uh, the first order approximation and looked at the zero of it, what would your next, if I did, if I iterated the Newton step twice, I think your eyeball is going to tell you what? Is, are you going to get a good, are you going to get a good approximation? Yeah, good. And then if you do it a third time, it's going to be like really, really good. Right? Why? Because if I zoom in on a smooth increasing function, right, as it goes through zero, if I zoom in, it just looks like a line. That's all it looks like. Um, the same is true over here, right? If I take this point, fit a quadratic to it, and minimize it, but suppose when I get when I get near the bottom here and I fit a quadratic to it, what? How good is how good an approximation is the quadratic nearby? It's really good, right? And so what all of this is giving you the kind of this intuition that this, this method should have some amazingly good terminal convergence, right? Which we'll get to in a minute, okay? So, and, and it's all true. Okay, um, and here's another, here's another very cool way to do it. 
Um, it turns out it's the steepest descent direction in the metric given by the Hessian. So that, and that, that makes total sense, right? Because, you know, again, you land at X, you ask someone, hey, what's the steepest, what's the steepest way down the mountain or whatever? And they, then they ask you, in what norm or what metric? And you, you say, well, do you happen to know the Hessian of the function at the minimizer down at the bottom of the valley? And they'll say, no, I don't. I just live here, right? Or something like that, right? Anyway, then, then they'd say, fine. Do you know the Hessian at the current point? And they would say, oh, that I do know. Okay, you go, fine, we'll use that. Everybody following this? And, and that would give you this, right? So, so it's very cool. And you can actually you know, plot pictures that shows, shows what a Newton direction is gonna look like, right? So, uh, and this is an example showing that you're gonna get a pretty good, a, a pretty good uh, Newton step, at least for this thing. Right, so, okay. So this is the Newton step. Um, then you have something cool called the Newton decrement. Uh, the Newton decrement, you can think of it this way. It's actually, it, it gives you, it, it's actually the one, a very good way to think about it is this. It is actually, it is the predicted decrease when you take a Newton step of the function accord, predicted by your quadratic model of the function. So that's what it is. Yeah, you have a, what the metric defined by the Hessian means? Oh yeah, it means I'm using a quadratic metric, uh, which is going to be this. Like when when someone says, "What's what? What is your unit? Oh, what's what's your norm?" And I'd say, "Oh, that's easy. I'll 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 take the norm to be this. Uh, this is my current point. So here, this is the norm of z. Oop, there you go. That's it. Yeah, that, that's that's what it means, right?" Yeah, by the way, there's, there's, if you have other ways to get a rough idea of the shape of your sublevel sets, like by all means use it. I mean, there's lots of other ways you might be able to, you know, there are, there are plenty of cases where you might have some other, be able to get another estimate, which is not the Hessian or something like that to get this, right? So, okay. All right. Um, so one thing that's very uh, cool about this metric is that it, it turns out it's lots of things, but one thing that's very important is it's actually affine invariant. So that's actually gonna be a big important theme. So if I change coordinates, if I, if I apply an affine co a transform to my problem and solve that, by the way, if you do that with Newton, uh, with gradient method, that's actually completely equivalent to using steepest descent with a different quadratic norm, right? So you can even think of steepest descent as uh, two steps with a quadratic norm is two steps. Step one, change core, apply a matrix so that your, your so that your uh, your unit ball becomes a, a, just a, a Euclidean ball. Another way to say it is, uh, actually, some people use a great verb for that, which is you round the problem, which is a great term, right? Because to round it means you know if your sub if, you, if your sub level sets look like this and you apply a coordinate transform, and then you just want it to look isotropic. You want, you want the curvature to be about the same in all directions, right? And someone says, why? You'd say, because when the curvature is the same in all directions, gradient method is outstanding, right? So everybody got this? So, okay. Um, so this is a new, and uh, so here, uh, if you change coordinates by a linear mapping, this doesn't change. It's, 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 it's the same number, right? So affine invariance is gonna come up later. Okay, so now we have Newton's method. So, I mean, it just uses the Newton step. Um, so you compute the Newton step and the gradient. You, you quit if this, 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 uh, this um, so-called Newton decrement is small enough. Um, then you use a backtracking line search, for example, and whatever. And this entire algorithm is affine is, is basically independent. It, it commutes with changes of coordinates, right? So in other words, if someone says, yeah, I, you know, I'm gonna, instead of mis minimizing um, F, I'm gonna minimizing this F tilde, which multiplies its argument by a non-singular matrix T, right? In gradient method, you get completely different iterates and all that might be faster, might be way slower. I don't know, it's just depend, right? But you'll get a completely different thing. Actually up here, it all goes away. And you can check because when you do this, 
you know, the gradient gets a, you know, a T in front of it, and then the Hessian gets a, like a, a T on the left and a T transpose on the right or something like that. And when you assemble everything, it all just goes away. So you get the identical steps here, right? So another way to say this, Newton's method is independent of changes of coordinate, of, of well, linear changes, any linear change of coordinates, right? So that, so, which is a, that's a extremely uh, good attribute to have. Actually, in theory, it's cool, but it's all, it's actually super useful in practice, right? So what it means is to first order, scaling doesn't matter for something like a Newton method. It doesn't make any difference at all. Just, it just, it, it, I mean, if you were gonna do the linear algebra in infinite precision, it literally wouldn't matter at all. Uh, whereas that's completely false for something like a gradient method, right? There, you change coordinates, and uh, you, if you do, if you change coordinates, you, you either get something faster or actually much more likely slower. Okay, so this is Newton's method. Um, so I'm going to give you the classical uh, convergence analysis. So this is actually, actually interesting. This is, this is actually from the Soviet Union around the 1930s. Um, but here it is. Um, it's actually super interesting. Uh, oh, and actually before we start, let's, let's, uh, l let me, I have to ask you a bunch of questions, right? Um, how well does Newton's method work on a quadratic function? Like, yeah, like quite well, right? Yeah, like how well? Like it converges in one step, okay? Why? Because one, me one way to understand what Newton's method is, is you say, you're at X and you say, please develop for me a quadratic approximation of your function, okay? What's a quadratic approximation of a quadratic function? Itself. And then the next step is it says minimize that. So, you, so actually while you're computing the Newton step, you didn't know it, but you're actually solving the entire problem. Oh, and by the way, um, yeah. Uh, how, yeah, N notice the other thing is, is that when you, when I ask you to minimize a quadratic convex function, what does that turn into? It's linear algebra. It's nothing else, right? Because the, the Hessian is affine in the, in, in, in the point. So it's just linear algebra. And so therefore that means I can, I can pull in all the stuff we talked about last week and we will. We'll do that later. That's another thread, but we'll be talking about what does it mean for a Hessian to be uh, diagonal? or, you know, banded or sparse. And we'll talk about all of that later, right? But so what it says is, so I mean, one way to say it is uh, computing a Newton step is uh, basically linear algebra. We, you know, a fair amount of linear algebra by now, you know, at least the, the, the beginnings of it. And it says it's just linear algebra. So we've kind of reduced solving a problem when you're doing Newton's method to, sol to a sequence of problems in each step you use linear algebra. Everybody, so it's kind of cool, right? So, okay, let's get back to this. Okay, so we established that Newton's method works shockingly well for quadratic functions. Um, so what, what's really gonna affect Newton's method actually is how well, remember how this all went, it all went this way. You wanted to use the metric, which was the Hessian at the solution, right? Instead, you use the Hessian where you are. Right. And by the way, that also explains why this is going to do really well as you get closer and closer, because that approximation is going to get better and better. Okay. So that's what's going to. That's so. Once you know, when you're in, when you're here, you know, right. When you're right close to, let's say, if, if this is a maximum likelihood problem, if you're right close to the to the parameters, then the Newton, Newton method is going to give you essentially, you know, a, an extremely good estimate of the parameter on the next step. Ready? Ready? Got this? Okay. So. Okay, so, um, all right, so what, what it depends on, so is actually the third derivative, if you think about it carefully. It's the third derivative that matters, right? So if the, because th the third derivative tells you how, how much the second derivative changes when you move. That's what the third derivative is, right? So if the third derivative of a function is small, then our intuition is that Newton's method should work unbelievably well. And someone would say, why? And you'd say, well, because it's getting close to what you really wanted to do, which was to use change coordinates or what, how are you use a metric, which was aligned with the Hessian, defined by the Hessian at the optimum. And you'd say, but you're not at the optimum. Yeah, but the Hessian changes very slowly. Okay, so I'm, I mean, I'm, there's not more to what I'm saying than don't, it's, this is not deep. Everybody got this? So. 
And you know, here's an extreme case of a third derivative being small. It's zero. What does it mean if a third derivative is, small, is zero? It's quadratic. Okay, so, so this makes, so all of us should be expecting it's a third derivative. That now, the third derivative of a function on R is something none of us should be afraid of. Third derivative of a function on Rn is something, all, it, it, this has to do with weirdness, has to do with our education in mathematics. We should all avoid, unless you're trained, it's a, it's a trilinear form, right? So, you know, if you're, if, if you're cool with tensors, people in mechanical engineering can do this very well. A lot of people in physics can do it because they're used to working with higher order tensors. They don't have any, I have friends and they're like, yeah, they don't, they don't scare me. Like, what do you mean? And I'm like, there's three indices. And they're like, yeah, and so, so I just, anyway, I'm just saying, unless you have it come from some weird fields, right? Then where you can, where you do handle these kinds of things, then it's, you know, it's complicated. For the rest of us who have been, have this weird education where we were trained about matrices, that would include me, uh, then we don't like, we get very uncomfortable when we go above two, two indices. Everybody following this? Right, so if you're in that, are, are you in one of these fields? Yep. Which one? Physics. There you go, physics. See, yeah, and they laugh at us and they say, well, that's contravariant, that's covariant, and well, I don't care how many of these Einstein know. It's fine, it's totally fine. Fine. So, so you wouldn't wouldn't bother you to take. Yeah. How about this? How about the third derivative of the log determinant of a positive definite matrix? You can pretend to visualize it. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. I mean, that's some crazy trilinear form that's got six indices, right? Because the original thing is indexed by two. Anyway, fine. All right. So, all right. So. Uh, actually, it turns out all we need to express is that the third derivative is small. So we're not going to actually work with third derivatives and trilinear forms. And we're certainly not going to talk about the third derivative of, let's say, the, lo the negative log determinant of a positive definite matrix, which, I mean, we, I, I could write it out. I can write out all the partial derivatives. I know what they are. I just don't want to write it down because of my training. So that's fine. Okay. Um, okay. So instead, this is often expressed as a Lipschitz constant, right? So uh, this, this is cool. This we can do, right? If I take the two norm of the difference of the two Hessians, right? And I say that that's less than L, right? So it has a Lipschitz constant of L. Then that's, that's kind of the, that's basically the same as saying that the norm of this trilinear form, which is the third derivative, is less than L. And this avoids us having to uh, get a headache because there's three indices and all that kind of stuff. Everybody following this? And besides, this is kind of what you want, right? So you should imagine that if that condition holds and L is small, you should, Newton's method should work really well. Because it says, actually, that literally says the Hessian doesn't change much as you move. And that, that's the key to Newton's method working really well. Everybody following this? Okay. So, um, so here you have some Lipschitz constant there. We'll assume that. Um, and then the way I, I won't go through uh, the, you know, showing, I mean, if you read the book, it's not even that long, but it's not the kind of thing I think that should be done in, in public is to walk through a proof of this kind of stuff because it just, I don't get it. But, but here, so the main point is you, the outline is actually pretty cool. It basically says this. If the norm of the gradient, is, there's, there's a number, and it says if the norm of the gradient is bigger than that number, then it guarantees, it absolutely guarantees a fixed decrease in the function. Right? That's cool. Right? Once the gradient gets less than that number, then you get something crazy, which is that, I mean, ignore the constants, but basically the norm at the next, the norm of the gradient, which is like, you know, how small, you know, how close are you to optimal, that is less than or equal to this. It, it's less. It, it's actually like this. Goes like the square, at most. Right now, to visualize what happens, you know, once the error is like you know 0 0.1, on the next step it's 0 0.01, on the next step it's 0 0.001. Wait, did I do that right? No, 0 0001. Right. Next time it's 1e minus 8, and on the next step it's 1e minus 16. And now we're at floating point precision, and we stop. Right. Everybody. Follow this, right? So, and if you remember linear convergence from the gradient method, linear, I mean, it's a weird name. Linear was um, on a log accuracy vertical axis and number of iterations. What, what that says is you kind of get a constant improvement each step. 
And the improvement is usually rather pathetic, right? Like it's you you multiply your error by 0.99. So you would so then it, you have to multiply things by 0.99 for a long time until you get 1e minus 6. Everybody following this? This accelerates. It the accuracy doubles every step once you get into this region. And this is going to be called quadratic convergence because on a log a semi log plot, it's going to be a quadratic. Okay? And, and it's going to be the way to understand that, that th this accelerates and goes, gets, it's the thing we observe just by looking at silly baby examples that once you're close to the optimum, Newton's method is going to work unbelievably well, right? So, okay. All right. Um, so the first part is called the damped Newton phase. And the second is called the quadratically convergent phase, right? And um, in these cases, you know, most of the iterations require uh, backtracking or damping. Yeah. Uh, I have a probably naive question. Um, is it true? Can we understand that if the property of the function f is uh, closer to the quadratic function, then the uh, the better the convergence result? That is, you could. That is a way to say that, right? That we we expect here that if l is small, right? That that that's one way of saying the the Hessian doesn't change as you move around that much, right? That that's what it says. Yeah. If then I would I would say that function is closer to quadratic than if l was really big, and so yes, we should expect everything to work when l gets small. Uh, things should work pretty well. Um, so yeah, we can. We, I mean, it's actually pretty cool if l gets small. This, this eta gets um, pretty big, and that means that you get into the region of quadratic convergence faster, right? So, so indeed, it does kind of go that way, right? So, but yeah, that's a perfectly good. How far is the function from quadratic? And because and someone says why, you say well, for a quadratic function, it's game over in one step, and then this is a measure of how far you are from quadratic. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so this first, this first bit, um, you know, it, it says since you're guaranteed in this case that you're going to go down by this, by this gamma thing, then f of x zero minus p star divided by eta is the maximum number of steps you could be in the damp Newton step, right? Once you're here, you get something that looks like this, and I'm just going to point out this is this is one half to the two to the l minus k, right? So so what happens is it just keeps it keeps going down. Um, it accelerates, right? It's this thing where you get four digits of accuracy, then eight, then 16, right? Um, as a practical matter, you don't do more than three or four steps in quadratically convergent phase because then you just hit mas machine precision and stop, right? So, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a story about that a little bit later. Okay, so this, so this, is, this, is, this is the idea behind um, the uh, analysis here. Um, and the conclusion is, uh, the number of iterations until you get something that's like epsilon suboptimal is no more than the current function value minus the optimal value divided by this number gamma, which we could just calculate if it's some number, right? Plus, and then the quadratic thing, since you're, you're doubling the number of basically digits of accuracy each step, it's going to be proportional to log, it's actually going to be log log 1 over epsilon, right? So, and you should read that in a, in a reasonable way, right? Uh, it, there's a very, very good way to think. Look, bisection is like log one over epsilon, right? Because you you divide your error. so, and then even something that only that multiplies your error by 0 0.99, that's also like log one over epsilon, right? Because it just I mean it's got a different constant in front, but it's still that's how long it takes. You get a constant fraction improvement each step. The log log is because when you get close, you start accelerating and you get faster and faster. Okay, so. Um, okay, so this is the, and that second term there, um, I think a normal person, you just read that second term as like three or five. Five is like generous, right? I mean, it's silly because it's, you're, it's like, you know, once you're, at, once you're in the region of a quadratic convergence, it's three steps and you're at, you're at double precision stationary. Okay, so, okay. Uh, now, there's a few problems with this. Uh, this. And this is the classical analysis, right? Okay, there's a few problems with this analysis. Okay, let, let's start with one. Um, uh, let's see, gamma and epsilon zero, and they depend on m, l, and the initial point. Now, 
Do you imagine in any practical problem you would ever know any of these things? And the answer is no. I can, are there cases where you do? Yes. If I'm doing, you know, logistic regression or something like that with some L2 regularization, I, I do have some values on some of these things, right? So that's the first thing. Um, okay, so, uh, and the other minor point is uh, P star is appears in my complexity analysis. So, so you're sitting there and you say, I'm going to minimize this function by Newton's method. You say, but I'd like to know how many steps it's going to take. Or actually, what I really need to know is like an upper bound. And the person says, yeah, awesome. It's like, it's that, okay? It's f of x zero minus p star divided by gamma plus log log epsilon. And then they'd, you'd say, uh, okay, uh, what's gamma? And you, no one, you're not going to know gamma, right? What's epsilon? You're not going to know that. And then you'd say, what's p star? And you go, oh, that's the optimal value of the problem. And you're like, Wait, wait a minute, right? So anyway, so then what this suggests is the, to actually use this. I mean, I'm making fun of it. Uh, the answer is you should first use Newton's method to minimize the function. Whereupon you know P star. Now you can actually go back and evaluate this and go back in the time machine and tell yourself an upper bound on the number of steps. Is everyone, it's completely ridiculous, right? So when you make fun of it, I mean, this is, by the way, people taught, this is like a crowning, you know, this is after two lectures of horrible calculations, you get to this, and it's supposed to be the crowning achievement. Everybody following this? So honestly, to me, many uh, classical Western optimization convergence results sound like this. Here's what they all sound like to me. They go, it says, if, and there's a long hypothesis filled with all sorts of stuff and parameters that you will never know under any circumstance. There's no way, right? If this is Lipschitz and there's L and there's M and strong, you know, blah, 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 blah. Then, and then it gives you a, then it will give you a bound on the number of steps for that algorithm, right? Which by the way, if you actually evaluated it with real numbers would be numbers like 10 million or 10 billion. It's completely useless. And you go, yeah, thanks. Um, actually, my observation, is that this converges in around 20 steps always. So thanks for the upper bound of 150 million. Thank, thank you. It's just, anyway, it's just, so it's, it, they all sound like to me. If a bunch of complete, utterly unknowable hypotheses hold, then a completely useless conclusion will hold. So that, that's my, ver that's, that's how I hear basically Western convergence analyses, right? And then when I confront people and say this, they get very angry, as you might imagine if that's all they did their whole life, was develop these. And then they go, look, you don't get it. I didn't want the number. I didn't want... You say, this is conceptual. God, this guy's so dumb. Like, the whole point of this, the, you, this is conceptual. This says, like, if you knew these numbers, then, it, then I can prove it'll take less than 150 million iterations. Anyway, so I, I don't buy it. I, I mean, it's, fi it's fine. It's, totally, it's better than knowing it's not going to work. It's better than, you know, other, some fields where you, where you say, I don't know, try it. But although you might have a little bit more respect for some of those fields anyway than, than the others. Anyway, okay, everybody following this? Okay, yes. Compute the Hessian of your objective. Uh, can you still kind of adapt this method? Like perhaps you could iteratively like get a approximate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so yeah. So if you can't compute the Hessian of, the, of, 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 of at, at the point, what can you? So, um, okay, so there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of other, there's whole fields. You could take entire courses on that. So there are quasi Newton methods where you approximate, you build up an approximation of the Hessian using only, let's say, gradient information. That's one. Okay? So there's a ton of methods like that. It's a whole field. Actually, some of those are really useful. So yeah, that's a, it's a good question. There's, there's also a lot of other uh, variations, right? Like here's one that actually is useful. Um, you evaluate the Hessian only, only every 10 steps. There you go. 10 was a parameter, but whatever, right? Then that actually makes perfect sense, works unbelievably well. And what we know, we, now that you know some linear algebra, you know the following. You compute the Hessian, factor it, and then when you're computing new Newton steps, it's just a back solve, and the cost is really low. Everybody follow? So there, there are a lot of variations, but yes, you're absolutely right, there, there's that, yeah. And actually some methods now, uh, like in things like, you know, in, in, in auto, using autograd and auto diff things, you just, you just call dot backward, dot backward, okay? And there are methods that do that, right? So, the, so that's even more radical. That's like, compute a Hessian, why would you do that? Like, I know, <laughs> I, I know how to do it with uh, auto differentiation, right? So there's a lot of methods that would be based on that. You had a question? 
I'm just curious, where do the optimization methods come from that we do respect or use? Oh, like if all the ones are right. jokes, then what are we using? Oh, no, no, sorry, the method is not a joke. Oh boy, no, 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 the analysis is a joke. In my, it, for, to me, it's funny anyway, let's put it that way. So I'm not making fun of the method. Oh no, oh boy, this works really well in practice. So the, the convergence yeah. analysis. That's a joke. To me, to, me, per, to me personally, that's a subjective thing. I mean, not to people who this is all they do, right? So, but to me, it, it's a little bit of a joke. Yeah, okay, so that, that, but the method is not. Oh, no, no, never, never confuse the meth. Yeah, yeah, these, these are different things. Okay, okay. Now, there's something even worse here, which is an aesthetic. So I've made fun of this enough, but I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna make it even worse now. Uh, so here it is. The, Newt, the actual Newton's method is affine invariant, which is an amazing thing. Like the entire algorithm, right? If you, change, if you scale change coordinates and it takes what, 27 iterations, you change coordinates, it takes 27 iterations, right? Which is an incredibly beautiful property. It says basically that it is, comp it, it is not sensitive in any way whatsoever to bad problem scaling and all sorts of other stuff. Everybody following this? Beautiful super useful in practice attribute to have. Okay, okay, now you say, okay, this is a beautiful algorithm. Could you please analyze it for me, right? And they come back and they say, yeah, no, no problem. Um, you need to tell me uh, L and you need to tell me uh, M. Okay, yeah, that's it, okay. Okay, everybody following this? And you'd say, excuse me, if I change coordinates, do the values of L and M change? And the answer is yes. And now you have a de aesthetically a deeply embarrassing situation because somebody who just wrote up the code in Rust or C or something has this incredibly beautiful thing. And the, like the actual code itself is now more elegant than the mathematical proof because the actual code is actually, it actually is invariant up to numerical, you know, numerical issues. It's actually invariant under a scaling or change of coordinates but the proof is not. Everybody following this? So, so basically what would happen is I'd say, how long will it take me to minimize this? And they'll say, oh, I don't know, a couple million iterations, no more than that. Of course, then it takes 12, right? So, so then you, you're like, okay. And then you'd say the exact same function. And then you'd say, well, I'm gonna, you say, if you don't mind, I'm gonna change coordinates, right? Well, the algorithm once again solves it in 12 iterations because it's, it's actually affine invariant. And you go, what's your upper bound now? And they go, oh, now? Ooh, boy, 15 million iterations for sure. I can prove, I can prove it will take less than 15 million iterations. And you go, well, thank you very much because just PS, it just took 12 again. Everybody follow? So this, this is bad. You don't want, this is not how the world should be. The world should be like this. The math is beautiful and clean. That's how it should work. And then you go and you dig deep into the source, which you probably shouldn't do. But if you do this, you should be emotionally prepared for what you're going to find. And you're going to find all sorts of constants buried in there, like 0.001 and this, that. And you're going to say, what? Did, what did, I didn't see that in the, in, the, in the LaTeX. I didn't see a point of buried constant. Point of, yeah, so that's the way it should be. And you say, just be quiet. We've tested it. It works fine in practice. Go away. That, that's, that's the way the world should be, right? But the math should be beautiful and all that. Anyway, this is the reverse. And to me, that's just aesthetically very bad. So everybody, everybody, yes. Why are we doing this method in like machine learning? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, ignorance is one reason. Um, I mean, actually, people sometimes do use uh, the methods you were hinting at or asking about, which are quasi-Newton methods. So th those are actually should should be quite widely used. Um, yeah, but, um, I mean, one here's a, a quick answer: is it, this is for smooth problems, smooth functions, right? So. This is going to rule out a lot of a lot of things, but if it's smooth, you should use something like this, right? So, and my suspicion is, like, if you look at things like logistic regression, or if you look at multinomial, if you look at problems where you really could, at my, uh, if you look at like what the R implementation is or whatever, it's almost it's probably this. <laughs> it's fine. So, um, okay. Uh, there's another big reason which I'll we'll get to later which is actually how to compute it. And it's actually the, it's actually super interesting reason. It's the reason it sort of dropped out of, you know, people stopped looking at this in the seventies and stuff like that because they were like, whoa, you actually have to invert a matrix, which we all know now means solve a set of equations. And then someone said that costs N cubed. And at that time it would be like, 
is really slow if you have to do it for 100 variables and 100 equations, which is like hilarious now because that's microsecond time for us, right? And that was the other reason. But now, you know, linear, you'd say, well, now you're smarter. After last week, you're more sophisticated. And you'd say, yeah, in general, that's true. But if there was some structure in your problem, then maybe we could do it faster. And then guess what? Smooth optimal control problems, smooth signal processing problems. You could do it in linear time. <laughs> no, but again, you have to know that, right? So, okay. Um, all right. Um, all right, so this is, so I've, I've made fun of this, I think, sufficiently. Um, but now we're going to get to something that's, well, first, actually, first we're going to look at some examples because, I mean, I'm sure you guessed this, but it works like unbelievably well. So, um, so I mean, here's, here's the number of iterations. Note that it's five. Um, I don't know if you can see, see the power here, but so basically it's just like you get, you get double precision accuracy and whatever. I mean, it's a silly problem in two, two things, in, in two, uh, dimensions, right? So um, everybody follow. Oh, by the way, on a semi-log plot, so iterations and log accuracy, uh, remember that linear convergence is a straight line. And that means you're basically making a, uh, a constant factor improvement in your uh, residual or whatever, or your error in each step. Here, it's, quad it's quadrat, it's accelerating, right? So, and in fact, well, as a matter of fact, you will be implementing a Newton method um, next week, I think. Is that true? Uh, homework eight, right? Seven. Or is it homework seven? Maybe? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Homework seven. That's homework like tomorrow. Seven. Is it? Is homework seven posted? Not yet. It'll be tomorrow. Okay. So yeah. So like tomorrow. You anyway. You're gonna. You're looking for. That's what you're looking for right there, right? Something like that. That's. This is a tiny problem, so it won't look that dramatic. But I'll show you what it looks like. Um, so here's an example in, in 100 um, dimensions or whatever, something like that. And it's, it's fine. I mean, uh, you know, once again, you see like very small numbers of iterations and uh, shocking accuracies, right? So this makes sense. Yeah. You do. That's right. Yeah. So, so you will make this plot after it converges. Yeah. Compared to whatever you know. Yeah. That's one way to do it. Yeah. I mean, there's another way to do it. Instead here, you could put like a norm of the gradient and that would also work. That you do know before it finishes, right? So these would be your, your either the, but, but the other one, these are made after you finish, right? So it, otherwise it sounds like the story before. Like, like what, how, what's the bound on the number of iterations? You go, no problem. What's the optimal, what's the optimal value? And you're like, Dude, I haven't even started. I was asking you how many steps it's going to take me, right? So, okay, yeah. Okay, so, and this kind of makes sense. Um, and you can go to a problem that's bigger. Uh, and actually, this will be a first one where we get something. But um, so here, it's a problem in 10,000 variables. It's, it's fine. And, and it's the same kind of story. Uh, and you see this thing uh, accelerating. And that, that tells you you're, you are in the region of quadratic convergence. Um, now I have a question, and this that this is uh, this will be fun, but let me uh, I, let's see what is it? Uh, no, this is fine. Okay, so in this one, um, you can see that you know it's a it's some big log barrier problem or something something like that. I'll 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 just leave it. Uh, I'll I'll leave it there. Let's do how we did. I have a I'm suspicious of something here. I'm deeply suspicious of the hundred thousand over there. Uh, do you mind? Do you want? Do you mind cross-referencing that against the book or something yeah, like that? I'll check back. Okay, it's fine. But anyway, it it looks like it's too 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 much. But anyway, anyway, so the idea is, and I, I mean, this is kind of a, this is ridiculous, right? So this is a, a function in what is it in ten thousand in R ten thousand. Just for the record, R ten thousand is a pretty big place, right? And then this says you stop and you ask for directions like eighteen times. Like you stop and you'd say, here's my X. And you'd say, hey, uh, and asking for directions is basically calculating the gradient and the Hessian, right? So you, you ask for directions 18 times. You go, okay, thanks, thanks. Then you do a backtracking line search, which is not, not very crude, right? How, how is it that in eight, 18, you stop, ask for directions 18 times and you end up at, you know, when finding the minimum of this thing in this giant, in relatively high dimensions, right, to high accuracy. I mean, I think you have to be impressed by this, I think. 
You should be, anyway. Okay. Um, so we're going to actually now uh, talk about... Um, actually, it's very cool. It is a theory I can get behind and don't make fun of. Yes? For like R10,000, does it, how long does it take to compute the Hessian? Ah, okay. So uh, that's why I'm sus I have a sus <laughs> suspicion here that, uh, here. Um, yeah, so I have a weird feeling. Did you, did you cross check that? I'm I don't think it's, I don't think that's 100,000 over there. I think I, it is? Oh, it's 100,000. Okay, that's fine. Well, we could actually talk about how to, you know, what, what the Hessian would be here. I'm, Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, sorry, I was missing something. It is 100,000. It says sparse AI. Okay, so uh, that's a great question. Let, let's, let, let's address it. Um, so if you knew nothing, you could calculate the Hessian, right? You get a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix and you'd have to solve linear equations with that. Actually, that's, on board, that's borderline fine. I mean, that, right, right now, that would be just totally fine. On GPU, it'd be a zero. You wouldn't even think about it, okay? I mean, it's not small, right? 10,000 by 10,000 matrix is 10 to the eight uh, numbers, multiply about 10 to get doubles. And so it's talking a gig. It's not that big, right? That's like current GPUs can handle a lot more than that. Everybody following this, right? And you can saw, you could, it's just not that hard. It wouldn't be take that long to, to factorize it and so on. Okay, but um, the key is here, that the AIs are sparse here. And so uh, not only that, the first term, I don't know, let, let, I wasn't going to do this now, but we'll do it a little bit now. So basically the, what it is is to solve for the Newton direction, we're actually going to use the linear algebra we, we learned last week, right? Um, what's the, what, is the, uh, what is the Hessian of that first term? I mean, just, I don't want to know. I just want to know, like, does it have a structure? What is it? It's got a super important structure, one that should should be after last week, like burned into your mind. It's what? It's it's what? Diagonal. It's diagonal. Yeah, yeah. What, what? So why? Okay, so a function is separable if it's a sum of functions of the of the individual components, right? If I take the gradient, right, then the fourth component, of, or here, just take the second. Let's do the second derivatives in our head, right? If I have a, if I, if my f of x is sum over i of f i of x i, and I take the partial derivative, partial squared of that with respect to partial x i, partial x j, it's zero unless i equals j. So that first one is diagonal, right? And then it's going to turn out the second is sparse. So the Hessian here is diagonal plus sparse. I mean, I guess the diagonal is already sparse, so it's just sparse. So that, that should answer the questions as to how we did this, right? So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that later because you're going to, then you're going to get the full connection. Actually, you'll be really cool when you get, get the connection all the way from the application to the sparsity to how to solve it. And then it's not a problem, right? So, and that'll typically go like this. I have this problem and you go, well, use Newton's method. And then someone, let's say trained in machine learning, just <clears throat> to carry on my insult from earlier, would say like, ah, ah, are you kidding? There's like 100,000 variables. You can't form, for, actually they wouldn't even know. But let's suppose there's one who heard about it, went into Wikipedia and looked at it or something like that and said, you can't do that. You can't form, you can't, you can, you can either form nor store 100,000 by 100,000 majors. And even if you could, you sure as hell couldn't, couldn't compute this Newton. You couldn't solve these equations, right? And then you'd say, chill. Because as a matter of fact, from your description of the problem, I've determined that the Hessian is, you know, banded arrow. And they'll say, what's that? And you go, just don't worry about it. What it means is I can form that Hessian and I can compute the Newton step really fast. Everybody got that? So that would be how that would work. Um, that's how it worked. Okay. Um, okay. Now the nec next topic, and you know, it, it, it's actually really cool. It addresses this question, this embarrassment really of the classical analysis of Newton's method which was less sophisticated than the actual algorithm itself, right? Because the actual algorithm itself is, is affine independent, but then the analysis, you change coordinates and they give you a different number for, the, uh, for, the, for their upper bound. I mean, it's still useless, but they give you a different number, 
Okay, so it turns out there's a weird variation on this. This comes from the late 80s and 90s from also Moscow. And it's, it's, it's developed by Nesterov and Nemirovsky. They have this 500 page, 600, 700 page book that I, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, they do look at, uh, they, 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 they do look at third derivatives of things like, they look at the third derivative of things like the of log determinant of a matrix, positive definite matrix, right? So they're, they're very, they're all, that's the classical Soviet math training, right? I, one of them, uh, Nemirovsky actually once told me, he said, he said, yes, we don't, we don't learn matrices. He said, for you, it is, it is a crutch. He said, it leads to sloppy and weak thinking. And he said, we don't do that until much older. He says, he says, we just do everything with indices. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. So like to not, so anyway, it's very, anyway, pretty, pretty crazy. Okay, fine. So here it is. And actually, it's a, it's a hilarious thing. It actually replaces, actually, it is only the following. And then by the time I tell the story enough, the solution is going to be kind of obvious, right? Although this was just stunning in the early 90s or whatever. It's a, basically, the, the issue with the classical analysis is that we had to say the third derivative is small, but we said it in a way that depended, was not affine independent. Everybody, that, that was the issue. Like, you know, I walk up, let's, let's say it's a function on just one, one, one uh, of one variable. So we don't have to worry about tensors and three forms, right? Okay, so, and I say, you know, how do you say the derivative is small? And like, here's the obvious one, right? Uh, you would say, uh, how about like this, right? That's there, that, that looks to me like a statement that the third derivative is small. And you go, cool. Change, now change, now you say, let's do an affine change of coordinates, and actually this scales. So this is not a way, this is not an acceptable way. I guess if I was gonna use the actual notation we were using before, it'd be that, right? Um, so this is not uh, a, a way to say the third derivative is small that is independent, in, 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 that is invariant under changes of coordinates, okay? So now you have to figure out how would you say the third derivative is small in a way that when I change, if I do a linear change of coordinates, it's invariant, right? So that's, that's actually what, you, what, what we're gonna get. Um, actually, what happens when you do this is the most stunning thing. Instead of a silly uh, theorem that looks like this, if, and then a whole bunch of absolutely unknowable hypotheses were to occur, th and then you say then, then you'd have a completely useless conclusion, right? That's my, that's my template for a, a traditional convergence result. Then it's actually gonna be very weird. It's actually gonna be if a small number of actually weirdly knowable things hold, then, and then the conclusions are actually gonna be, mm, they're, gonna, they're not gonna be hilariously wrong. Uh, they're, they're not gonna be hilariously useless. Uh, so, okay, so that's the, that's the idea. So I'll, we'll, we'll look at this. Um, Okay, and actually we need to use it later in the class. So, okay, and, the, and they call this self-concordance. Um, so here it is, um, it's this. It says uh, a function is self-concordant if the absolute value, this is from, just from R to R, if the absolute value of the third derivative is less than the, uh, two doesn't matter, that's just for convenience, uh, the second derivative to the three halves power. Okay, so that's it. Now, uh, and the reason is this, is this is affine invariant, right? If, if I replace, uh, the, you know, if I, if I replace this, if I have F tilde of Y is F of A Y plus B, then what happens is the third derivative scales like the cube of A and the second like the square, right? If you take those numbers and you plug it into that formula, the A's drop away. Everybody, Got this? So as a matter of fact, as an exercise, if I just said, write away, write down something that says that their derivative is small, but it has to be invariant to any affine change of variable, you kind of would have to come up with that. Uh, everybody, everybody see that? You just, you just have to, right? So I don't know if this makes, uh, ma makes sense. Um, now, on the other hand, if someone just walks up to the street and says, yeah, I was thinking about Newton's method. I have a new definition of small, uh, sorry, nearly 
I have a new I have a new definition of the third derivative small, or I have a new definition of what it means to be nearly quadratic. It's that you would go like, what? Where did that come from? I mean, it's a bit shocking, right? So okay, everybody got the idea. Um, so some weird things happen. Um, it turns out that a lot, certainly not all, not all, uh, certainly not all convex functions are so-called self-concordant, but a whole lot of the ones that you, we encounter are. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's that. And you'd say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, you kind of would expect a Newton's method based on this to be, a, an analysis of Newton's method based on self-concordance be, you'd imagine it to be simpler, and you would be right. Um, and there's some, there's, there's a lot of weird uh, calculus uh, stuff here. You can actually work about various things. But actually, it's kind of cool because you end up showing that a lot of the things that we care about, here's one right here, right? So weirdly, that's just, it's self-concordant, which is, would not be fun to show. It's not that hard, actually, to be, tell you the truth. It's not that bad. Um, and a bunch of other functions are and things like that. So, I, you know, I, again, I'm not going to, I don't, this is not, um, I mean, it, it actually elucidates why a lot of practical things actually do work well. Uh, but I would say that as a practical matter, it's not that important, right? But, but we can, we'll, we'll go, keep going. So when you do, when you, in the sense of Nesterov and Nemirovsky, do their analysis, they end up with something pretty crazy. Um, this, the, you actually end up again, it's a, it has exactly the same form. It says, now you're using the Newton decrement. Uh, in the classical analysis, we're using a norm of the gradient. Norm of the gradient is not affine, not, not affine independent. If I change coordinates, then the norm of the gradient changes, right? Um, here, but remember the Newton decrement does not. That's an affine invariant quantity. And so it says if the Newton decrement is bigger than some number, then you get a guaranteed decrease. Um, once on the other side, you get something like that. And so you get this very, uh, this is a complexity bound that looks like that, right? And yeah, these things depend on the backtracking parameters, but a sloppy analysis would, uh, tells you that it ends up saying that the maximum number of iterations is less than 375 times f of x zero minus p star. Yes, that, that issue is still there, right? Um, you know, plus six. Um, six is, is the way I, I say log, 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 one over epsilon. In fact, I used to, uh, I used to give talks when I knew there were going to be a bunch of theorists in the crowd. I replaced uh, log, log with uh, four and would do this just to taunt them. Just taunt, and I'd wait, and sure enough, I'd see somebody itching, and they're twitching, and then they're like, they're like, wait, this is an iterative algorithm. Like I, had, like, I was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. By four, I meant log, log, one over epsilon. That, sorry, that's a macro for me. That's anyway, it was, it, it works pretty, you could, I recommend this if you know people like that, you could try this too. Yeah, so, uh, okay. Um, all right, there it is. That's the, 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 there you go. So you get actually something that's weird. What's weird is that these are actually not, uh, I'll show you just some examples here, but here's, here you're minimizing a, um, you are minimizing a, uh, um, it's a log barrier for a set of linear inequalities or something. And then what we did was we just, so this is, uh, so to explain what we did is we generated a sample, solved it using Newton's method, noted the number of iterations, and we also noted at that point P star. Then we could note this, right? Uh, which is the difference. And then you just scatter plot it and you get something like this. Now, by the way, the bound is a line that would be almost vertical here, right? because it's got this coefficient 375 in there. But still, what's interesting is, actually, it's really interesting. Uh, it looks like if you're, if you're like deposed in a, in a math courtroom or something like that, um, you know, with, with scary uh, people all around you, uh, listening to everything you say, hoping you're gonna say something wrong, you use the number 375. That's fine. And then they would say, is that true? And you go, oh, that's actually a true, that's, that's actually true, right? But what, what tell, what's very interesting here is that if you replace the 375 with one half, for example, it actually gets a pretty good estimate of actually how many steps it's going to take. Um, so this make, makes sense. Um, and it's, it's actually pretty cool. So you can actually give a, a talk 
uh, to two audiences and they can even be mixed together, right? Because you just put a constant in front, like you, you just say it's this. And then if someone says, what is a true statement? You'd say, well, to make this a true statement, I'd have to say 375. But if you wanted to say, here's something that is probably true and a good approximation, you just change C to 0.5 and you're done, right? So, okay. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, so that, that, this is how that works. Oh, by the way, um, can someone explain this one? So here, uh, this difference was like, I don't know, let's say it was 12, but it, it converged in eight iterations. So someone, what, what word would you say if someone said, explain that? What, what happened there? How about just dumb luck? Right, there you are in some, I don't even know what the dimension of these things is. We don't, okay, it, it, I have no idea. It's either 50 variables or 500 variables, doesn't matter. But the point was, you asked for directions, went that way, you asked again. Six times later, at seventh time you asked for directions, and then by dumb luck, it just happened to point exactly towards the minimum, right? So, so, so that's what those are. Th those, are just, those, are, those are just dumb luck. So, um, yeah? On the previous slide, uh, what was lambda that? Uh, oh, what's lambda? Lambda is this Newton decrement, right? So that's, that's actually, it's this, right? It, it's the gradient uh, here. Actually, it's something like this divided by two, I think. Actually, lambda is the square root of this. Or something. Hey, this is very close. Lambda, oh, here, let me put it. Yeah, okay, here. Lambda is, is something like that, and there's a factor of two in there. Right, roughly. So, I, I can't remember where the square root of two goes, but that's what it is. It's it's a actually it's super interesting. It is the size of the gradient in the current Hessian norm, which is pretty. And and that's how you that's how you could kind of guess that it's going to be affine invariant, right? So, okay. Um, so we looked at this a bit. Um, and now we'll say a little bit about implementation. This is actually far, far more important. And this is interesting because now we're going to tie it to last week, which is numerical linear algebra, right? Because the, so basically what it says is, let, let's review where we are. At a high level, you would say this. How do you minimize a smooth convex function? And the answer is Newton's method. And you say, well, what does that do? You say, that converts the solution to how do you solve a, a smooth uh, convex function is, we don't know how to do that. But we do know how to minimize a convex quadratic function. That's easy. That's actually linear algebra. That's solving a set of linear equations, right? So you could say that Newton's method reduces the solution of the, the minimization of a smooth convex function to minimizing a sequence of quadratic functions. And someone says, okay, how do you minimize a quadratic function? You go, ah, that's linear algebra. That's called linear algebra. Everybody following this? So when you roll it up, it says that we can minimize a smooth convex function by an iteration that's going to take some number of tens or whatever of iterations. Each iteration is linear algebra, right? And in fact, the linear algebra is very simple. You're just solving this Newton, this, uh, this, uh, Newton system, H, H times delta X equals minus G, right? Um, you know, one way to do it is just by Cholesky factorization. Right, so you, you do a Cholesky factorization and that'll cost you n cube plots for an unstructured system. Um, you know, um, okay. But here's the interesting part. If the Hessian is structured, then and you know how to exploit it, or even better, basically you, you know how to call the right libraries to exploit it or something like that, which is what, the, that's what I mean when I say you know how to exploit it, right? Um, if, if that's the case, then this works really, this is going to work really well. And I, 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 let me just give a couple of examples uh, about how that works, right? So um, let's, we could do it. I mean, it doesn't matter, but we could do uh, some kind of, opt, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll just do some kind of signal processing problem or optimal control problem, right? Where you're, you're estimating something, but it's a, uh, in, in that case, the, the, the variables only interact uh, locally, 
right? In, in, in these types of problems, like in a control problem or something like that. What will happen then is uh, the Hessian is then going to be banded, right? Because, you know, variable X doesn't interact with variable, you know, XI and XJ. They only interact if I minus J is small enough, okay? That means, that means, if you go back to last week, that says, oh, we can solve those systems in linear time. Like, I would not be afraid to solve, I can certainly solve, I can compute the Newton direction if H was banded, let's say with a bandwidth of 20, if it's a, if in a million dimensions, I could solve that problem. This I guarantee you people in machine learning have absolutely not the slightest idea of. Okay, there might be one or two, but I, I doubt any more than that. Okay, maybe a few more, but not, not that many, right? So, um, and that's actually part of the reason it is very interesting is when people say, oh, you couldn't use Newton's method. Why not? You go, oh, well, first of all, you have to form this Hessian. And second, then you have to solve it. And everybody knows that's n cubed. But the point is, if it's structured, it's not. Right, so, okay. And then you'd say, how often does structure come up? And the answer is a lot more uh, frequently than you would imagine. Uh, you know, I mean, it, that also kind of makes sense, right? So, okay. So this is, this is um, Newton method, uh, in the, how, how you'd actually implement it. Um, oh, by the way, I mentioned this other method where you update, you know, basically the, the quadratic. What you do is you calculate the Hessian like once and you use that as your, you use that for the next like say 10 or 20 steps, right? You don't update the Hessian, you update it every 20 steps. It's got a name for it and I forgot what it's called, that method is called, right? Um, uh, how do you do that here? And what's the cost of that? This is completely dense, right? No structure in the Hessian. What do you do? Every 20 steps, you evaluate the Hessian, factor it, that costs you n cubed, okay? Then how much do actually computing the Newton steps when you have different gradients here? What, what's, the, what's the number? Or it's n squared. Exactly, so if n is big, that's a big, that's a big savings, right? So, um, by the way, that method works perfectly well. People don't implement it because I think they're just lazy, so they just factor every time. But it's an old method from the 70s or 80s, and it's per perfectly good, right? Pro probably people should use it. Um, okay, so here's a quick example. But I think, I think what we're going to do is we're going to quit uh, here. And we'll quit here for now. And then um, I think there's, there's a, there's a numeric. You're, you're actually, let me just mention one thing. You're doing something on the homework. And you're actually, we're only going to cover the material for that next Tuesday. So you'll have to read ahead to... Newton method with equality constraints if you want to start on that earlier than next Tuesday. This is a heads up.